Professor Hrant Kostanyan speaking about Armenian European Union relations. Hrant. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me just start by saying that I'm thrilled to be back uh, to LA and uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for this very important and timely uh, conference. Um, I was very happy to actually uh, look at the title and find the word transition in it. Uh, why? Because the EU, European Union, Armenia relations are actually relations about transition. And as I will argue in my uh, presentation, but I, I would, I, no, no, I, I would need to, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, as I'd argue in my presentation, uh, uh, despite over two decades of rhetorical commitments on the side of uh, EU and Armenia in particular, the European Union and Armenia relationship ha has remained a story of stalled transition. Stalled transition to the democracy and stalled transition to market economy. And what are, what are the main reasons for this transition uh, to be stuck? Uh, and those are, in my view, two. Uh, first of all, it's lack of political will from Armenian side, from elite of Armenia, uh, to actually reform. And secondly, it is the, the weakness of the EU's offer. Uh, in order to understand the, the, the EU-Armenia relations, it's very important, and, and in in general, EU's relation with any country uh, in the world, it's very important to understand what EU, European Union is. Um, here you, you see on the map uh, what we call Cartier Européen, and that's where the main European institutions are. The European Commission looks like a cross. Uh, European Commission is the European <coughs> Union's supranational body that oversees and protects the interests of whole Euro European Union and its citizens. Across the street, you, will, you see the building of the, what we call Council of the European Union, and that's where 28 members of the European Union are situated, each of them uh, looking after its own interests and then acting in consensus, especially when it comes to the foreign policy. There in the middle, uh, you have the European External Action Service, and on top, there is a building of the European Parliament. Um, here you see the buildings from the front, and it's very important here also to mention the, the European Union delegations, uh, basically embassies around the world, and one of those 140 embassies is in Armenia. So for the system actually to function, you would need all those links to function properly, and that's how the EU gets its act together, and often it's long, treacherous, and difficult to get a consensus among the 28 member states and the European Union institutions to act uh, uh, in its uh, foreign policy. In fact, it's a bit more complicated. There are more lines going around, and th those lines have to work quite well. And this is also, uh, in fact, oversimplification. But in fact, what, what happens within European Union actually is very important on what the European Union can do vis-a-vis -vis the third countries, including Armenia. But now let's look at some of the policy frameworks that the European Union has vis-a-vis -vis the neighborhood, uh, including Armenia. So those are partnership and cooperation agreement, European neighborhood policy, Black Sea strategy, Eastern partnership, bilateral and multilateral frameworks. I'm not going to focus on all of those uh, frameworks of the cooperation, but I'll pick a few of them as I'm mindful of the time. So let me start by the very first agreement that the European Union signed with Armenia. Uh, that's, uh, that the, the agreement was negotiated right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and in the mid-90s, the agreement uh, was signed. That was called Partnership and Cooperation Agreement. In this case, Armenia was not unique. Uh, most of the post-Soviet states have signed a similar agreement with the European Union. That includes also Russia. Um, two countries that haven't actually signed this agreement uh, with, the, with, the European U with the European Union are Belarus and Turkmenistan. So what this agreement was about, it was about transition. It was about European Union helping Armenia to make a transition from the communist system to democracy, from the plant economy to market economy, and also helping with financial aid 
uh, including also improving investment uh, in, the, in the country. So that's the very first agreement, and I have to say that unfortunately up to date, this is actually the agreement that is the legal basis for the EU-Armenia agreement. Now in 2004, European Union has uh, come out with a new initiative, this time grouping 16 countries of its neighborhood into so-called European neighborhood policy, and the book that was just uh, shown, uh, that I've just published uh, uh, two months ago, is about the Europe, assessing the European neighborhood policy that goes back to 2004. What basically this policy included is countries uh, all the way from Morocco to Middle East in the south of the European Union, that's what was called Southern Neighborhood, and on the east, six countries from Belarus to Azerbaijan, including Armenia. In fact, when this policy was first initiated by the European Commission, South Caucasus was not supposed to be in it. If you go back to the first documents that the Commission has issued, uh, the South Caucasus is not included. However, uh, after uh, Rose Revolution in Georgia, the, the, the profile of the region was raised and actually Georgia was, inclu was included in the program. So. Uh, where the Armenia, so where Armenia and Azerbaijan. Basically, what the European neighborhood policy would try to do is to negotiate bilateral um, action plans, which if each of the country, including the Armenia, where both sides, EU and Armenia in this case, agreed upon the, uh, pri some priorities that both sides had to implement. And with Armenia, there were eight general priorities that uh, European Union and Armenia agreed to uh, cooperate. This included uh, dem democratic structures, human rights, economic development, uh, improving administration, energy strategy, uh, issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. Every year, European Commission since then issued a progress report on what was uh, achieved uh, in this uh, cooperation. Often uh, the progress report read also as a regress report and not so much about the progress. Now, uh, in 2009, uh, European Union came out with a, a new policy vis-a-vis -vis the Eastern neighborhood. And the important thing here uh, was shift from a soft uh, sort of cooperation to a hard law. Whereas in 2004, the European neighborhood policy was uh, based on uh, joint action plans which were not legally binding and vague in nature, what came in 2009 under Eastern Partnership, especially the association agreement and in particular the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement were based on legally binding commitments on both sides. In fact, the agreement had four major components and Armenia has negotiated this agreement for four years. The first part was political dialogue. Uh, second, justice, freedom, and security. Those, both those parts were very in-depth and strong in commitments. However, again, those were namely, mainly declarations, and there was nothing that could enforce such declarations. However, when we go to the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, this part of the association agreement, in fact, included about 85% of the European law, which means if Armenia were to uh, sign and implement this agreement with the European Union, uh, Armenia would look very much in terms of legal and regulatory framework and standards would look exactly like Belgium, the country that I come from. Uh, and, this, and of course, the last part, sectoral cooperation, which included about 28 sector cooperation sectors in, the, in a cooperation that includes uh, things like environment, energy, education, culture, health, etc. Uh, what happened, however, with this agreement after four years of negotiation uh, in September 2013, when the agreement actually was concluded in terms of negotiations, uh, President Sarkisian makes a, an abrupt uh, visit to Moscow, stands next to President Putin and, and declares that Armenia will not, in fact, sign this agreement but instead will opt for joining the Eurasian Customs Union. Once Armenia joins to the Eurasian Customs Union, uh, now Eurasian Economic Union, of course, Armenia cedes its sovereignty to make any trade deals with any other partners, including the European Union, which means that 
the deep and comprehensive agreement, which is the most important part of this agreement, is not anymore possible. After um, the uh, rejection of the association agreement, European Union and Armenia have wisely taken a strategic pause. Armenia used this time to, uh, to become a member of the Eurasian Economic Union and then return back to restart the talks with the Euro European Union. And what happened here was that um, the negotiators had a very difficult task of restarting and, and renegotiating the existing agreement. On the part of the political dialogue and justice and home affairs, there was not much of a problem because Eurasian Economic Union uh, is in fact an economic union, at least on the paper, and it, there it's not a political union. So Armenia could keep political dialogue with the European Union as it was in the association agreement. Uh, however, when the issue came to the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, there, there were problems. So negotiators took into account the Armenia's already existing commitments vis-a-vis -vis the Eurasian Economic Union, and that part that Armenia committed to the Eurasian Economic Union could not have been included anymore into this new agreement. And that's what is very interesting to see in this agreement when it comes out in two weeks in the new agreement, how deep Armenia and the European Union went into this direction. I think this part would not be as deep, of course, as it was in the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. And unfortunately, because this is the part where in fact there are legally binding commitments and this was the part where there was a clear schedule of implementation of the agreement. Um, on the sectoral cooperation, the picture is going to be a bit mixed. Um, not only negotiators had to take into account the commitments that Armenia made vis-a-vis -vis the Eurasian Economic Union, but also bilateral commitments between Armenia and Russia. For example, one of the sectors in this 28 sectoral chapter cooperation is energy. And in, at the end of 2013, uh, the same year when Armenia announced that it will reject the association agreement. Armenia has also given a lot of uh, its powers in the especially gas sector to Gazprom. Basically, Armenia up until two, uh, 2045, I think, Armenia will not have rights to make any regulatory decisions as far as the gas sector is concerned, which means that in this sector, Armenia is not allowed to have any deep cooperation with the European Union. Another important element in the new, newer negotiations for the, the latest agreement was the EU's attitude. Uh, most of the EU's parts that I've shown have uh, showed political will to continue cooperation with Armenia, but not all. For example, department in the European Commission called FISMA that deals with the financial markets shed, showed no interest to restart a deep cooperation with Armenia. Ar Armenian uh, Central Bank wanted to have a deeper cooperation, but FISMA that deals with the uh, financial uh, market in the European Union said, we don't have resources and time, so we cannot go, we're, we don't intend to go deep uh, in, in cooperation with you. The same was another department in the European Commission called DG Santé, uh, which of course you understand from French that it means uh, health. So related to the health and sanitary issues. And that's also another department that uh, does, did not show much of an interest in cooperating with Armenia in depth. Uh, to sum up uh, the issue of the new agreement that has been now concluded and the text is supposed to be available soon, uh, the agreement is still ambitious. Uh, however, it is not close to what the association agreement and deep and comprehensive free trade agreement were. Now, if we look at some real figures of the cooperation between Armenia and uh, the European Union. Here in the chart, you see that uh, one of the major uh, things that the European uh, did uh, with Armenia is to offer financial support. And here you see a breakdown since 2007, uh, the EU's support to Armenia and also Georgia and Azerbaijan. Uh, this is a significant support, uh, and, and uh, uh, although small, but some part of this support also goes to the civil society in Armenia, which is uh, rather important. Another important element of the EU-Armenia cooperation is trade. Uh, 
The European Union is the biggest market in the world. You have 500 uh, million uh, customers that are able to pay. It's a prosperous market and uh, much bigger than the United States. And here you see that actually Armenia hasn't done that well in, uh, uh, sorry, in, in uh, cooperating with the European Union and using the European Union market. There is a huge deficit of, uh, in exports and imports when it comes to the European Union. Armenia exports to the EU much less than it imports and that creates a significant trade deficit. And why the deep and comprehensive trade agreement was important in this because it was supposed to change the regulatory framework of Armenia in a way that Armenia could export uh, its uh, goods and services to the European Union much easier. Another area is, of course, uh, when we talk about European Union and Armenia cooperation is people-to-people uh, -people contact. And here you see the short-term visas that uh, the EU issued for Armenians to travel to the EU. Again, uh, you see the number, uh, both Arme uh, here, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, and you see that Armenian number is actually smaller, although we have much greater uh, diaspora in the European Union. Now, um, coming back to the argument I, I was trying to make in the beginning of this presentation, the EU's offer presents itself, it has certain weaknesses. And first of all, the European Union's offer is Eurocentric. Uh, the most important element in this offer for the EU it's, is its own security concerns. Uh, European Union does not want, does want to export stability to its neighborhood, including Armenia, and it does not want to import instability uh, to the European Union. Uh, the whole idea of the European neighborhood policy going back to 2004 was to create a, a circle of the well-governed, friendly uh, neighbors. However, if you look at the neighborhood now, that goal did not materialize. It, is, it looks more like a ring of fire to borrow from uh, famous Johnny Cash. Um, secondly, after uh, uh, looking at the EU's own interest within its own offer, the EU protects its own customers. Whatever the neighbors produce that has to come to the EU, be that agro-food or industrial goods, they have to be in accordance to the European Union standards. Uh, thirdly, the EU pushes its neighbors, including Armenia, to have, uh, to, to have a real competition, a, a level playing, playing field for the EU businesses, so that when EU businesses go to the neighborhood, they play with the same rules as Armenian businesses. And, and here, of course, it goes both ways. And EU opens up its own market for Armenian businesses, and if they want to, that they could compete at the same level as the European businesses. In fact, if you look at the heart of the European Union's offer, it is rather Eurocentric, and the EU's interest is, comes first. That said, however, this offer was, a, is, was and remains a very important element for modernization of Armenia. So Armenians could still use this offer to modernize the country. Let me now conclude by uh, talking about uh, elaborating those, this mismatch between, on, on this mismatch between uh, what EU offers and uh, what Armenia needs with two uh, major points. The EU's offer is weak because of its structural constraints. In fact, EU is not a military actor, and when dealing with Armenia or South Caucasus, being a security actor is very much important, but EU is not. Secondly, the weakness of the EU's uh, offer stems from con contextual uh, concerns, meaning that the currently and over almost a decade now, European Union is in a constant crisis. It's a, it's, it, it was in a crisis in terms of financial crisis, banking crisis, migration crisis, Euroscepticism, rise of populism, and Brexit. So, in fact, not only EU's offer is weak because what EU is, but what EU is going through in the last decade, to say the least. And that led to the downsizing of EU's ambitions for the neighborhood. And the word differentiation came in, especially in 2015, after EU revised its neighborhood policy. The agreement, the new agreement with Armenia, in fact, is 
the manifestation, the first serious manifestation of this uh, differentiation. Before this, 2015, EU would offer all the neighbors association agreement and DCFTA and would say, you take it or you leave it. Now, with the new Armenian agreement, it is uh, actually applying differentiation, which is if you don't want the top offer of the association agreement, we can still cooperate with you somewhat less ambitious level. And that is why it's very important to note again that the agreement with Armenia that was just concluded is an extremely important step. It's a step that uh, I welcome. However, we have to see about its implementation because rhetorical commitments in the last 25 years were not really a problem. The real problem lies in how those commitments translate themselves into a practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.